This is chapter two, section three, India. The vocabulary for this section is going to be subcontinent, Himalayas, Mount Everest, Hindukush, Indo-Gangetic Plain, Indus, Ganges, Monsoon, Levees, and the Harappan Civilization. Previously, we had talked about how Pangaea had split up and how the different continents were moving about the world. India was originally a continent about half the size of Australia. About 70 million years ago, it ran into Asia. In the picture here, you see the hood of the car buckled up. The same thing happened when India hit Asia. The land buckled up. This formed mountains. India was going about six inches per year, which doesn't sound like much, but when you've got the weight of a whole continent behind it, that is a huge impact. Most continents only move maybe a quarter inch a year or so. India is now considered a subcontinent. This means that the Indian subcontinent is a part of Asia, but at the same time it retains its own unique culture, its own weather patterns. The uh, mountain ranges have kind of cut it off from the rest of Asia, and it does its own thing. Marked on the map, you'll find the Himalayas, the tallest mountain range in the world. The tallest mountain within that range is the famous Mount Everest. Now, be careful when you're asked a question because the letter S can change everything. Singular, what is the tallest mountain in the world? Mount Everest. Plural, what are the tallest mountains in the world? The Himalayas. Make sense? To the left or west of the Himalayas, we see the Hindukush. This is a shorter set of mountains that borders India. Um, through here, we will actually be seeing people gaining access to India, despite the Himalayas forming a very large barrier along the north and east sides. The Indus River system runs down in the west, the Ganges runs in the east, and here is where the culture is going to be built, along the rivers, just like they were in the other sections. Now the flat area between the rivers, you'll see the bumpy texture on the map indicates mountains. There's that flat area at the end of the Ganges that goes over to the Indus. That is the Indo-Gangetic Plain. For spelling, go back and check the vocabulary list. Indo-Gangetic Plain. This is where a lot of the farming is going to be going on because it's the flatter, less rocky area that has access to the rivers. The mountains that surround India form natural barriers. India is not going to be invaded very often simply because people can't get into it easily. In India, they have what's called monsoons. Now, a lot of people associate the word monsoon with a rainstorm. It isn't. The monsoon is the seasonal change in wind direction. Now, when the wind is blowing out to sea, it is holding back the clouds. They can't get inland because the wind's blowing the other way. But in the summer in India, the wind switches direction and brings the clouds in from the ocean. This is why the term gets associated with the storms. The wind, which is the actual monsoons, pull those storms in with them. When the monsoons bring storms in with them, the clouds often get trapped up against the Himalayas. This means that the clouds cannot leave until they've rained out all the water they've got. Now the floods that are caused by this can bring good soil. You'll remember from the previous chapter, silt, the nutritious soil brought by the rivers. But they're unpredictable, very dis destructive floods. Unlike in Egypt where they're fairly predictable, easy to work with. These could come at any time. Monsoon changes are by season, but you don't know exactly when the wind is going to shift. And the rivers would sometimes flat out change course on people. A flood would unblock an area that used to be blocked and the river would change direction. An earthquake from the pushing into the Himalayas of India can cause a landslide that blocks an area of the river. Change it may be five, ten feet in the mountains. But once that angle's been changed, by the time it gets down to the bottom, the river could move hundreds of miles. These are some of the difficulties that the early people of India had to deal with, and some people today in India are still dealing with. We can't be sure how the first people got to India. The two biggest theories are either overland through the Hindukush Mountains because they are lower than the Himalayas and wouldn't require oxygen tanks to climb, or possibly from East Africa via ships by boat. To this day, we have no idea which one. Either of these are a viable possibility. About 4,500 years ago or so, cities were beginning to be built along the Indus River area in the Indo-Gangetic Plain. The cities required levees in order to hold back the water. 
Now, a lot of people mix these up. A dam goes across the water and holds the river back from flowing. A levee would go alongside or around a town area in order to keep the water from flooding out of its normal banks and normal area. One of the largest of these early cities has been named Harappa, so as a result we refer to the entire culture as the Harappan civilization. Harappa had many unique advancements. One of these was city planned on a grid. The cities were actually done with horizontal and vertical streets that crossed each other, kind of like we have today, forming square or rectangular blocks. Walls divided the districts of the city. It doesn't mean anybody was like trapped in one district or another, it's just a border between different sections. Some of the houses in Harappa were up to three stories tall, an extreme achievement for this early in history. But probably the biggest achievement was a sewer system. Pictured here, each house would have a bathroom where you could do your business, throw down a bucket of water behind it, and it would wash it through these channels that are depicted and out of town. No other civilization would achieve the ability of indoor bathrooms for the majority of its population until the late 18 to early 1900s, the 19th to 20th centuries. Samples have been found of the Harappan language, like the one depicted here, but the problem is, unlike Egypt, we have no Rosetta Stone for Harappan. With 400 or so written symbols found, we have no way to translate any of them. This is part of why this section is so short for the book. We just don't have enough information to really study in depth. Without written language, we learn a lot more about the Harappans from the artifacts they've left behind. You'll remember from previous sections that artifacts are man-made items, such as this toy wagon pictured. This wagon indicates to us a wealthy society. Not only does it depict a merchant carrying goods, showing value in trade, have two animals showing the ability to afford maintenance of multiple pets, but it also tells us things like the children had time to play. In Egypt, in Mesopotamia, a lot of times the children had to work the fields alongside the parents just to make enough food in order to survive. But in Harappa, there was time for toys. We can also tell by this that they had developed the wheel. Now, there is indications of Harappan interaction with Mesopotamia, so there's no way to tell if they invented a wheel on their own, separate from the Mesopotamians, or if it was part of the trade that they picked up through cultural diffusion. Almost no weapons have been found in the Harappan civilization. This tells us that this was a peaceful people, at least compared to Mesopotamia and Egypt where wars were constantly breaking out among different city-states and factions. Some archaeologists speculate that Harappan culture may have been a theocracy, ruled by religion as we learned with the Egyptians in the last section. But without translating their writing, and with no definite temples being found, it's really hard to justify this speculation. Some figures and carvings indicate the possible connection to modern-day Hinduism, but again, it's very difficult to know for sure. One hypothesis is that the early Harappan religion was intermingled with a different group that had invaded. It didn't happen very often, but India did get invaded. And that these two groups combined belief systems in order to create Hinduism. It's very difficult to tell for sure without translating the writing. Probably a trade and barter system was taking place in the economics for Harappan civilization. Not that we found evidence of it specifically, but simply because we haven't found evidence of coins or a money system. We do know that they traded as far as Mesopotamia because samples of Harappan writing have been found in Mesopotamia, and we think they might have been able to trade as far as Egypt based on goods from India being in Egypt. But we don't know for sure. Could it be that the Harappans traded with Mesopotamia and Egypt? Yeah. Could it be that the Harappans traded with Mesopotamia and then Mesopotamia sold some of the Harappan goods to Egypt? That's possible too. There's no way to tell for sure. Eventually, the Harappan civilization was abandoned and fell into decay. We don't know what the cause was. Recently, well, in terms of 1970s, being fairly recent in world history, satellite photos were made available. 
it was only in the late 60s that we learned how to put things into space. But once we started getting satellites up there and taking pictures, we began to notice things about geography and geology. Remember I talked about rivers sometimes changing directions? There's signs that about the same time period that the Indus River Valley cultures began to kind of dry up, pardon the pun, you'll get that in a moment, that the rivers may have changed direction due to earthquakes up towards the Himalaya Mountains. It's still a mystery, but as our technology improves, hopefully we'll acquire more information about it.